Is this 1726 Prill Avenue? No. Is there a Prill Avenue in this neighborhood? I don't know. Do you know a man by the name of LaFong? Carl LaFong. Capital L, small a. Capital F, small o, small n, small g. LaFong. Carl LaFong. No, I don't know Carl LaFong. Capital L, small a. Capital F, small o, small n, small g. And if I did know Carl LaFong, I wouldn't admit it. Well, he's a railroad man, and he leaves home very early in the morning. Uh, he's a chump. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rolaine. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select, and we will discuss why it is significant to us. This episode is your choice, so what do you have for us? This episode, which is episode number four, we will be discussing It's a Gift, the W.C. Fields vehicle from 1934, directed by Norman MacLeod, also starring Kathleen Howard, Baby Leroy, (laughs) <laughs> Tammany Young, T. Roy Barnes, and Charles Sellen as Mr. Muckle. And so why did you choose It's a Gift? I chose this one because when I was six, at most maybe seven, I distinctly remember my father describing in explicit detail the scene in which Mr. Muckle, the blind and almost completely deaf gentleman. (laughs) Very hard of hearing. Destroys W.C. Fields' grocery store when he comes in to buy a pack of chewing gum. (laughs) It was one of, it was my, it was one of my favorite things to see my dad reenact and tell because he, he thought it was so hilarious that he couldn't keep it together even telling the story. And I took a great deal of pleasure with his glee in describing how W.C. Fields would suppress his frustration and that would manifest itself by way of these (laughs) terms of endearment that he would call Mr. Muckle instead of the names that he wanted to be calling him. (laughs) The honey and the deer. And and the the sweetheart. (laughs) And and so at six years old, I suppose, just the combination of my dad enjoying the story so much combined with the utter chaos that he was describing yeah. appeal to me more than maybe any other thing I could think of. But you didn't get to see it then. No. You had to wait, I'm guessing. I had to wait until I was about 14 before I finally saw it, I think, on American Movie Classics. Mm-hmm. And at that point, what struck me, I think, was the vocabulary yes. of it. And how musical and grandiloquent the words that were coming out of his mouth were. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's still one of the fun. It may be the funniest movie I've ever seen. It's definitely the funniest W.C. Fields movie in my book. And okay. quite possibly my favorite comedy of all time. Okay. It's, it's probably 1-1-A with The In-Laws. Wow. All right. Okay. So uh, an obvious choice for you. Oh, for, easy. Especially in comedy. Easy. Yeah, I had this. I taped this. In addition to Million Dollar Legs, mm-hmm. and that's the the uh, that with the, when they have the Olympic team, right? right? When he's okay. the president of Klopstockia. Klopstockia. <laughs> and I taped it off of American Mu- Movie Classics. I had a VHS tape that had "It's a Gift," Million Dollar Legs, and I want to say "My Little Chickadee" that I played over and over again until you, the image virtually wore off yeah. the tape, or until. My grandmother surreptitiously, quote, lost, unquote, (laughs) the tape because she was sick of having to sit there and watch me watch it because she hated W.C. Fields. Why did she hate W.C. Fields? Because my grandmother was an insane person (laughs) who harbored an inordinate amount of celebrity grudges, mostly born... (laughs) Of her consumption of Star Magazine and National Enquirer. So if she read that W.C. Fields did she, something to somebody... She would have never read that in th- these magazines. But at that point, he was he was long dead. 
He died so in 1946, I oh, think. Oh, gosh. Okay. And so he would have never been fodder for these things. But it was that type of thing. Yeah. The way she hates, hated, the way she irrationally hated Bill Murray, <laughs> she also hated W.C. <laughs> Fields with the same white hot passion of a thousand sons. Okay. So me watching that videotape over and over and over again was like a jackhammer on her yeah. skull, probably. Yeah. Imagine if... How did grandmothers now feel about, I don't know, Finding Nemo? Do they bear the same oh, grudges it, against... I'm sure they do. Albert Brooks? I'm sure they do. <laughs> For no reason? Okay, so that's the the first time that you saw it was on AMC. Right. Okay. And the first time that I saw it, uh, you did for me what your dad did for you. You had described that scene in particular and other bits so many times. Well, not so many times. I didn't know you that long, I guess. But you did it enough and you got me to watch it. And I say got me to watch it because I was very resistant to W.C. Fields and, and some other things I sort of lump the Marx Brothers and the Little Rascals and the Three Stooges in with that, that I was aware I was aware of all of those things. They were all available to me on television mm-hmm. at that point when I was when I was younger. And I had not watched them because I guess my parents weren't really into them, so they didn't have it on. And I I guess I got this idea that they weren't as funny as they are Was somehow. Laurel and Hardy, were they in the same boat as all I that I think stuff? probably Laurel and Hardy. And now I watch them and they're amazing, especially what's the Laurel and Hardy we watch where they're the piano movers? What's it called? The music box Okay, is what I think that one's called. So I watch these things now and they're so much fun and they're as hilarious, I think, now as they were then. And I, I regret missing decades <laughs> of enjoyment and hilarity. So... That's how I saw it the first time. And now I've only seen it twice. So I'm really a W.C. Fields fan. I think you are a W.C. Fields super fan. He is uh, an absolute hero of mine, for why sure. Do you, why do you think that is? Because I aspire to be the curmudgeon. <laughs> aspire? That he... <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Well, at least to be able to sustain it for that long. Okay. I aspire to be the curmudgeon that has that uh, grandiloquent vocabulary Okay. that he had. I think he got a bad rap, actually. I think he was a lot more soft-hearted. I, I mm. mean, I, it's a joke that, you know, that, I'll, that that line that's attributed to him that actually was said about him, not by him, that any man who hates dogs and children can't be all bad. Oh, oh I didn't realize that. Okay, I didn't know that yeah. was... He uh, he actually never said that. That was said about him, and that's actually not even accurate. He had a dog or two in his lifetime, and he loved kids, doted on his grandson, mm. uh, for mm-hmm. instance. And any time he got letters from aspiring young jugglers, for instance, oh. which he was a fantastic yeah. juggler, he always answered them and really? sent them a letter of encouragement. Well, that's... So this that makes whole me rap, like him even more. Yeah, this whole rap about him hating kids uh, spawned mainly because of his adversarial relationship with Baby Leroy. Which is uh, my favorite parts of any movie Baby Leroy's in with um, him. It uh, kind of misrepresents what he was like off screen. Well, it truly, okay, I'm jumping ahead mm-hmm. um, and you can tell me to stop. But I really thought the movie was going to end with he and the dog... At the shack and and the dog giving him some comfort. I I would if it had ended right then, it would have been a beautiful, mm-hmm. lovely little kind of serenade to the American dream. But it doesn't. But anyway, I digress. Well, I guess we should. talk. It seems so natural. Since I guess. since we're talking about the end, yeah, <laughs> talk about the maybe we'll break beginning down, in the middle. Um, just a little bit about the film itself, although plot doesn't necessarily mean a whole lot in W.C. Fields films, especially films like this one, which is just an excuse to string together his funniest comic sketches or something like Never Give a Sucker an Even Break, in which he is basically much to the chagrin of all of the studio heads and the director and even the fictional character that Franklin Pangborn is playing 
is making it up completely yes. as he goes along. <laughs> and it gets more absurd and expensive every step of the way. Yeah, plot doesn't mean a whole mm -hmm. lot. So the plot, such as it is, is about Harold Bissonnet, which is, Bissonnet. Pro which is pronounced Bissonnet by everyone except <laughs> W.C. Fields, who insists you pronounce it that way in front of his wife. His wife. Held. Being a struggling grocer in New Jersey who has his heart set on buying an orange ranch after he falls heir to a small fortune left to him by his Uncle Bean. Sure. <laughs> and how he uproots the family, a family that neither appreciates nor understands him, That's which true. we'll come back to. Yes. And takes them cross country to chase his dream. Mm hmm. And that is basically the skeleton on which he hangs all of these bits of business that he has honed and refined, for, in some cases, for over a decade before he gets to the point where he puts them on film in 1934. So the big ones that we think about in this, the Mr. Muckle, and I'm thinking about the when they're getting ready to leave with the, the bit with the car. Are those things that are those included in those bits that he would hone? Or they are. There are. Other... They are. Some of those go back as far as 1919, Whoa. or at least the first time they were copyrighted was 1919, and they're a combination of things he either did for the vaudeville stage or for his early silent films. And you can see, for instance, a lot of the stuff in this movie, and it's a gift. You can see in a 1926 silent film called It's the Old Army Game. And then also a little bit of it in the silent film the year after, in 1927, a film called Running Wild. As if he's uh, really testing out and trying some of this material on film for the first time. And those things later rear their head in a much more finished version in this movie. Well, I'm thinking specifically, you mentioned him uh, uh, before about his juggling, being a really mm -hmm. accomplished juggler. And you showed me a clip of, I think, one of his very famous pieces with the books mm -hmm. and the uh, all of this hand work. Yeah, that's in uh, the old-fashioned way. So, also with Baby Leroy. Oh. <laughs> that's the one where Baby Leroy dunks his wash in the molasses, and then he kicks him. <laughs> yes. Take that, baby Leroy. Anyway, so my question is about the silent films. Mm -hmm. So how does... We talked about his wordplay. So much of it is about his wit and his wordplay. So how does that work in the silent films? There is no comedian who benefited more from the advent of sound yes. than W.C. Fields. Yeah. He was visually clever, Yes, obviously, when yeah. you see a lot of this stuff. But he would have never distinguished himself among the pack of that tier that was just below Chaplin and mm -hmm. Keaton and Harold Lloyd. Mm -hmm. He would have been kind of that second tier forever had sound not come along. And it, he really been able to take advantage of his voice and his language. Yes. Well, having said that, then, I really cannot separate in my mind... Uh, him having a silent career. All I can think about are the films that I see now and tied so clearly with the words. Right. The advent of sound was kind of a bellwether for him in terms of developing a really distinct, actually two really distinct comic personas. Most comedians, period, I guess, sort of have that thing where they trade on their specific personality, mm -hmm. their quirks, their traits. Those that he was in competition with at the time very definitely had that. Chaplin had the little tramp. Buster Keaton had his stone face persona. Mm -hmm. The Marx Brothers had their particular individual elements within their anarchic thing that they do. Yeah. And he sort of split into two, and each one of those having a foot in a very specific cinematic and even before that literary tradition where he was half the time the philosopher con man mm -hmm. and the other half of the time the henpecked anti-hero mm -hmm. none of which could have happened without sound and without sound it would not have been half as funny absolutely i think he's an excellent physical comedian even better oh he's verbal comedian you, when you look at him and this is the thing about this is one of the things about him that often comes as a big surprise to people when they find out what an accomplished juggler he was. Yes. And he he billed himself as the world's greatest eccentric juggler <laughs> in his vaudeville that days. That seems believable. Yeah. 
you don't expect the grace and dexterity to come out of that peculiar egg-shaped body. Yes. With those little legs and the little stubby hands. Mm -hmm. And you don't expect him to be nearly as dexterous and physically graceful as he is. He's one of the greatest physical comedians I've ever seen. I I think that that's really clear, and you can't cheat it on this man. All of the stuff in the circus seems completely believable that he's doing all the physical work. Right. And he did it for, at that point, he'd been doing it in some form or fashion since he was a, a, a teenager. Yes. Since he was a very young man. When he first began vaudeville, and he was doing things like faking his own drowning to... How did he do that? He worked at a particular theater where his job, and this appeals, this story, I love this story because it's a perfect synopsis of the sort of chicanery and larceny that's in his heart. Yes. Lovable. Lovable larceny. He would, they had, the theater that he performed at was on a boardwalk and he would go out into the sea and fake drowning and be rescued, at which point they would carry him into the theater <laughs> to resuscitate him. And after a large enough crowd had gathered, they would then start the show. That's what you pay your nickel for. Right. We talked about the two personas, and there was that clear line from the vaudeville and the faking the drowning to the uh, philosophical con man. Right. And the other one that you mentioned was the uh, henpecked anti-hero. So where does that come from? That has its roots also around the same time when he was still that young man who was making his way on the vaudeville circuit he met his wife hattie who was also his assistant in the juggling routine and they did that for a short while relatively and then she had their son at which point soon after that she asked him to give up show business altogether which he could not or would not do And it was a source of a lot of friction between them. And they eventually became estranged. And he went to Hollywood and never really saw much of them ever again. And so that was that was very early that that she was asking him to stop. Yeah. Yeah, So there are still years to come for him to keep working before he even starts making movies. Right. Okay. And he did keep in touch and he still sent her a weekly stipend all those years and supported her and his son, but he always harbored a kind of pain and bitterness and feeling like she abandoned him as much as he abandoned her, and she turned his son against him. And you see those things rear their head in quite literally almost everything he does after that point. And just watching the films, if I didn't know any of this backstory, I think it becomes clear over and over the the wife is the same kind of wife. The kids... There are two kinds of wives. Okay. Most of the time, she's a horrible shrew. It's the Herald. Right. Once in a while, like in your Telling Me, she... I don't know if you remember that one very well or not, where he's the inventor, Sam Bisbee. Uh, oh, yes. And she is... Mildly irritated okay. with him sometimes, but clearly... But she's generally okay. Clearly loves him and okay. and supports him when it comes down to brass tacks, but still can be a nag sometimes. Uh-huh. That formula varies a little bit here and there, but most oh, of the okay. time, okay. it's terrible wife to one degree mm-hmm. or another, annoying milk toast son, uh-huh. which was clearly Claude. In fact... Uh, I want to say it's in Man on the Flying Trapeze. He even names the annoying son-in-law, Claude. Yes. Grady Sutton, who is in... He's got the southern accent, right? Grady Sutton does. Right. And he's in... He's the... in the bank dick. Yes. And, okay. Uh, he's also in You Can't Cheat an Honest Man. He's in a, a, a few of those. And had an, a whole other career, too. And right. I enjoy seeing him. Whenever I see him on something else, it always yeah. makes me smile. In the Man on the Flying Trapeze, he plays his annoying milk toast <laughs> son-in-law. And he actually gives him his real son's name. So it's personal. Yes. And then sometimes... There's and a this daughter is, right. sometimes. And sometimes this is... And this is the formula. This is the iteration of the formula that I like best. There's an older daughter who gets him. Yes. Who understands and appreciates him 
and is always on his side. Yeah. And that is a fiction. That character in his life did not exist. That's that was too wish bad. fulfillment. I really like how those relationships play yeah, out. In all of, those movies, it's really warm. Yeah, it's one of my favorite things about the ones that are constructed that way. Mm. Okay. Well, too bad he didn't have that. Until his grandkids came right. along. So how do you see all of those things manifesting themselves in this movie? I see clearly that that strained marital relationship uh, that, oh, if he could, that gleam in his eye, if he could just let that roam free, everybody would be so happy. And why don't you want to go along with him on this orange ranch? I sure do. It looks great in that picture, <laughs> that hardest rendering that he has. And so, so you've got that strained marital relationship. You've got the punk son who's always throwing his, his roller skates. skates around the house. And... Oh, annoying. And, and undercutting his dad to his mother, you know, tattletailing on snitch. him. Yeah, he's a snitch. And then you've got the daughter. The daughter in this one, she is, she's got this boyfriend there in town and she doesn't want to leave. She's so a little she's, self-centered. Yeah, she is. Um, and let's see. So, we've so got in this the, case, everyone's against him. Everyone's against him, truly. His, his only, only ally is his dog. His dog. His cute little dog. Yeah. Um, and, but even then... When they're having the picnic, and <laughs> the dog goes after the pillow. <laughs> Can you blame him, though? No. That was pretty fun. Yeah. But he's he's at his side there at the end, and then the family comes around. Right. Well, it always <sighs> resolves itself that yeah. way, because it's it's never it never is complete bitterness or rancor. It's always, you're an old fool, but I love you. Yeah. And at the end, there is frequently this windfall mm -hmm. that is either an inheritance or... Through some stroke of dumb luck, he comes into a fortune, and that tends to be a balm on all of the domestic problems, right. at least for a little while. So as the credits begin to roll, the family is a unit once again, and they are at least by his side until this money runs out. Yeah. What I like about it, so there's the stroke of dumb luck that the land turns out to be really valuable. However, what I like the most about it is the philosophical con man comes into play in that lovable larceny where he still puts one over, essentially, on a chump to get the highest value that he can. Right. So it's not, you don't just end with the dumb luck. You still got the... Uh, huh, huh, huh. Well, that shows up in a million different little ways, too. For instance, in the at the picnic they have... When his horrible wife insists that he give his only sandwich to the son, who's already eaten a full <laughs> meal, he takes the bread apart, folds the meat over so that it's on one half, and then rips the sandwich in half and gives, gives the kid the just bread. the bread. So, yeah, at every turn, he is constantly kicking back, at least in his own small way, against getting screwed over by everyone all the time. Yes. And it's bits like that that are timeless... And universally funny. Yes. When you cheat a kid out of hilarious meat on a sandwich. Always. Kicking kids. Always funny. <laughs> Never not funny. <laughs> but the stuff holds up really well, I think. I, I agree with you. What makes you say that? Well, I saw it for the first time in the uh, latter 2000 teens, right? Or middle 2000 teens. Right. So I saw it for the first time. As an adult, as a practically a middle-aged adult, uh, decades upon decades upon decades, almost a century removed from when he first did it. And I'm still laughing. And I think it is the combination, as I had mentioned earlier, of the physical and the verbal comedy. The verbal comedy for me above all things, because I never get tired of really intelligent wordplay. That's, that's still funny. It's not, aren't I so clever? Right. It's... It's well, done with a love of language, not with... Yes, thank you. He's not showing off. No, he's not. He has a genuine affection for the sound and meaning simultaneously of a word. It seems incredibly natural when he does it to me. It holds up for a number of reasons. It's not just the skill, the verbal skill or the physical dexterity. It has to do with themes. Mm -hmm. It never gets old to see an every man underdog yes. fighting for his dream. He belongs to, at least for me, he sort of belongs to that a similar tradition of 
very specifically American, and I mean that in the best way for me, literary heroes or literary figures that people like Mark Twain, Edgar Lee Masters, Carl Sandburg, people who both equally revere and satirize this sort of small town Americana. Uh, I guess you could throw Sherwood Anderson in mm-hmm. there too with Winesburg, Ohio. And they've got the skills to do it. It's not It's not average. It's not mediocre. No. It, it's done, again, the same as with the language. It's done with a real affection for that type of person and that archetype. They aren't having fun at someone's expense. No. But they are definitely pointing out the foibles as well as the virtues of the space that those people occupy in American society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In his case, in W.C. Fields' case specifically, I think some of that is fueled by where we are in the Depression relative to the art he's making. Because you have a rise in populism around that time. And so everyone wants to feel like there's an opportunity for someone who has a big idea. Uh, Go West, young man. Absolutely. Yeah. And he embodies that thing that was happening in American culture to a large degree really well right then. And I think that's a lot of what his success was based on in that stretch in the early 30s. And for me, that doesn't go out of style. I'm still a dreamer. I'm still a striver. I'm still thinking, oh, where can we go and what can we see and what can we do that's not in our little apartment here, you know, wherever in New Jersey, wherever. So these themes of worn dignity and eternal suffering and helplessness (laughs) under the heel of either big business or the domestic cage that Mm -hmm. you find yourself stuck in all of that all put together in this package that is smarter than average absolutely really appeals to me at least and it's and and it had to have to have fostered such a large audience for him at the time and uh, it doesn't seem dated to me because it's not it's not topical humor, even though it is grounded in its time as well. I guess that goes back to the themes that transcend mm-hmm. that time period. Right. The pitfalls of everyday life are the pitfalls of everyday life, yes. be they 1934 or 2015. Especially when those people from the maternity hospital called me <laughs> and you were giving me... Bad rap about that. It's never good to have burglars <laughs> singing in the cellar, which is a different film, but still. I guess it, which is a good point to talk about maybe Tammany Young and okay. his other cohorts that he had in his films all the time. How? Tammany Young is my favorite. And, and, in this case, he plays Everett, the shop <laughs> assistant, who... Is his... <laughs> when he's looking over, he's asleep in the yeah. corner. He starts out, he's asleep, and then he is as interested, or possibly more interested, in minding baby Leroy rather than watching the store because Mrs. Dunk gave him a 10 cents piece. <laughs> Putting baby Leroy in that in the basket, ca- the basket. to shoot him across the store, <laughs> letting him turn on the molasses. <laughs> Oh, everybody, every person in these films, one line, two lines, they're all funny to me. Every, Tammany funny Young to me. was hilarious and very accomplished outside of his association with Fields, which is what most people probably know him from. Mm-hmm. They did seven movies together, I think. Oh, okay. All together. Um, but before that, he was big on Broadway. Producers kind of considered him a good luck actor. Oh, wow. And so he was cast in a ton of shows prior to going to Hollywood. But it was his association with W.C. Fields that really hit, that really, where he really hit his stride. Mm-hmm. Um, and I read these descriptions of him as being... W.C. Fields is stooge no, often, which no. oh, is That's completely what I'm saying. unfair. Every person with a line is funny in their own right. Yeah. Yeah, they, they a foil, sell it. maybe, but not yes. a stooge by yeah. any means. And another hilarious thing that I don't know if you know about Tammany Young, he was notorious in showbiz and gossip columns for being a terrible gate crasher. <laughs> if there was ever a party... <laughs> He found a way in, oh. and you would find his name in bold print in the columns 
week after week after week in all of these places where he was not invited. If he puts me in that cage and sends me across the store, <laughs> oh, he can come to any of my parties. If he lets me turn on that molasses, no problem. Sadly, um, he died in his sleep in, in 1936. Oh, shortly, right after this. Yeah, they made it all that they made that run of films together, and then at age 49, I think is how old he was. He uh, heart failure oh. in the middle of the night, and Fields was crushed. He went into a deep depression after that because of, he was one of his best friends, and oh. you can really see that yeah. in their interaction in this movie and everything else. Even when they're saying to one another, <laughs> "I hate you," there's a real <laughs> bond between the two of them. Well, and th- I think you see that too with the actor who played Claude later on, and oh, uh, Grady Sutton. Yeah, mm-hmm. th- I think you can again. It's uh, not the Stooge. It's right. they obviously have something together, have some chemistry together. Right, and there is that very distinct chemistry that he has with Kathleen Howard that made her the perfect foil as the nagging shrewish wife mm-hmm. to she she is essentially she occupies the same space the same amount of importance as Margaret Dumont does for the Marx brothers as the perfect person to work off of yes also not a stooge right. i never think of her as a stooge oh, not i at think all. she's so talented not at all the major difference between dumont and kathleen howard being uh, you could tell you could tell dumont was good to go <laughs> Kathleen Howard? No, no, not so much. I'm not interested. Not even uh, maybe with John Durston. No, I think I think she was after some of that John Durston. No, I do not think so. No, no Everett. No, no, that guy that walked by and said, "More power to you." No, that guy. Not even that guy. <laughs> okay. Margaret Dumont had that gleam in her eye all the she time. She was having some fun. Yeah, she was always up for a good time. Okay. Kathleen Howard is not interested no. in a good time. <laughs> All right, so he obviously has chemistry with a number of actors that he enjoyed using over and over and over again. Yeah. And that also translated into, as you were mentioning previously, refining these bits. Oh, sure. There are a number of comic elements that you'll see again and again. In addition to cast members with music, an example like On the Banks of the Wabash Far Away, which is sung in the campfire scene in Mm -hmm. this movie, and it's a gift which inspires him to sing the Two <laughs> the, Sweetheart the, song. His barbershop. What was he in? The, the Cox and Hose Glee Club. <laughs> but you also see the same song in The Man on the Flying Trapeze when the mm-hmm. burglars break into his house and start drinking his Apple Jack in the cellar, he, which is Tammany Young is one of them. Oh, and I didn't Walter Brennan that. is the other one. Okay, Walter Brennan, I knew I didn't realize that was yeah, Tammany Young. They, and too. so they're singing on the banks of the Wabash far away down in the basement. <laughs> But he does that with a lot of things, and he will reuse things and refine things. Like I mentioned, a lot of these sketches were written as early as 1919, some of them even before, I'm sure, as just germs of an idea Mm -hmm. on the vaudeville stage. And each time they get funnier and tighter, and it's because I think he is finding the most efficient way to get at what is most universally funny in yes. each one. It's uh, it's kind of a weird analog with, and I know this is kind of a strange comparison to make, but I see him as both a contemporary of and analog of Yasujiro Ozu, the venerated Japanese filmmaker, because you'll see in both of their careers, they span sort of a similar time frame. And they did a similar thing based upon how important these issues of marriage and family Mm -hmm. and domestic life were to each of them. They revisit those things again and again and again. And each time they do, they find something that's, in Fields' case, more funny Mm -hmm. and in Ozu's case, more poignant maybe. But each time they get to the thing that's more true. And they work these themes over and over and over again. But you never get tired of watching them explore the idea because they do it so well. Yeah, yeah. Now, was Ozu also in a glee club? (laughs) I don't think so. (laughs) Although I don't know. He might have been. (laughs) He could have been. Now, Ozu's career, he spanned... uh, He did did comedy. Mm -hmm. 
But by the time they got to the point where they were doing, they were kind of masters of their own destiny and making the films that each one of them wanted to make, Ozu was very much in the family drama mold, mm -hmm. whereas W.C. Fields was doing these comedies. But Ozu did crime films, comedies. But the thing he's most noted for are these uh, really poignant and stirring family dramas. When we're talking, just for my own interest, when we're talking about these years of mastery specifically for Fields, so what years are we talking about? Well, for Fields, it's probably 32 to 44 okay. or so. Okay, okay. The real, he really hit his stride. It's funny that you mention it because this year, 1934, when It's a Gift was made, was a super prolific year. And some of his best, well, some of my favorite things at least come from that year. You're Telling Me, mm -hmm. Six of a Kind. All of these have fantastic bits. You might have seen from Six of a Kind the episode where he tells about how he got the name Honest John. Okay. Um, the Old Fashioned Way, which you have mm -hmm. seen. I have seen that one. Uh, and Miss Wiggs of the Cabbage Patch, starring our favorite Zazu Pitts. <laughs> Zazu Pitts. As well. So, yeah, the... Early to mid-30s were probably where he was really on fire. And then the things he's known as well for, I guess, Chickadee and all of that stuff, mm -hmm. that, that came a little bit later. But mid-30s are probably his uh, his heyday. When did he stop making films? I want to say the last thing he made was in 45 because he died shortly after. Right, in 46? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I was reading a really... Uh, there are two... There are two particular myths. I'm, I'm not sure if they're, they're at least apocryphal stories. Mm -hmm. Two competing apocryphal stories about his death. Each one that I really love. One of them, one of the stories about how he died was that he was in the hospital. He turned to his nurse, held a finger to his lips to say shh, and then went away. And the other one, his... Uh, partner Carlotta Monti at mm -hmm. the end of his life, she told this story about how when he was uh, on his final day, she went outside and sprayed the hose on the roof so he could hear the sound of rain on the roof one last time because it was his favorite sound mm -hmm. in the whole world. Another either one reason of those, why you like him so much. Yeah, either one of those stories is fantastic. I hope one yeah. or both or <laughs> some combination of the two are true. At any rate, with all of these threads, all these facets of his character and his home life and the refining of his material that he did, they all meet. All of those things intersect in this particular movie as a distillation of the funniest version of all of those things. Yes. That's what appeals to me so much. The thing I like the most is that he is smarter than everyone else. Right. And I will always respond to the smarter than who is not a jerk. Yeah, he's still punching up. He's still aiming at targets that are above him. Mm -hmm. which... Yeah, he's not keeping anybody down right. that way. And he's he's only trying to uh, lift his family. Everybody's circumstance through that. But what it comes down to for me is that it is funniest because he is smartest. When we, when it came to this episode, it was presenting a little bit of a challenge for me because I, we sat down to watch the movie, as we do, and I was started to take notes. And I think I wrote down two things that weren't particularly of interest, probably Baby Leroy right. with an exclamation <laughs> point, was one of those. And I realized, truly, we're not talking about the film itself. Again, we, we mentioned the plot is simply a vehicle to get from... Wonderful gag to wonderful gag to wonderful gag. And so we're talking about fields. We're talking about the jokes. So we could essentially sit here and just read the script rather than, right. you know, talk about, well, the point at this or, or the direction or the, uh, it doesn't. Yeah. Well, the theme is always going to be the same. We've established essentially. He's either going to be the huckster mm -hmm. or the downtrodden husband. Yes. On the run and or doing battle with the forces of these minor injustices that happen to him <laughs> on a constant basis. I do. The minor injustices is correct. None of which is portrayed any better ever in anything he's ever done than the centerpiece back porch scene in this film, where which begins in the house with him answering the phone at 4.30 
with someone calling, Looking mistakenly for- thinking it's the maternity hospital. But because of that, he ends up having to go sleep on the back porch in search of a moment's peace. Yes. Because the way that scene opens, it's, it starts with the bedside alarm clock, which reads 4.30 a.m., and the first line of dialogue is... And another thing! <laughs> So, the haranguing never stops. So, he's just looking for the slightest moment's peace. And he goes out to sleep on the porch swing. And he doesn't get any moment's peace in the next... I would have to count it. Scene six runs about, things that happen that in that scene? That scene runs about 15 minutes out of a running time of maybe seven. Because uh, there's the... There's the milkman. Right. And there's the coconut. Right. And there's the... Mrs. Duncan, Mrs. the daughter. Mrs. Duncan, the daughter. And there's the insurance. And there's the port... The, there's the swing itself. Right. Falling down. Mrs. Frobisher and the clothesline. Clothesline. The vegetable what? man. The vegetable... Jeez. It never ends. It never ends. It's solid... The, it's solid jokes. Right. Solid jokes. Nonstop. And... Even even more perfect than the jokes are the slow burn with which the whole thing occurs. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what appeals to me watching the scene is the mounting frustration. And again, the injustice and indignity of just wanting something so simple and never being able to lay your hands on it. Yeah. And it's just, it's hard for me to, to try to articulate this and why my notes were, I just stopped. Right. It is hard. It is hard. Um, in fact, I would say if you don't laugh at that scene, then there's something broken inside you. I, th- I agree. It's such a pivotal scene. In fact, the working name of the script up until maybe it was almost finished, the film was almost finished, was just the back porch. That's oh. how important the yeah. scene was to to the whole thing. And you've got these other pivotal, you know, sort of gags, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, but there's there are not a lot of other things individually that I can touch on. We 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 talked about how great the supporting cast is. We right. talked about the solid honing of the jokes and the gags, and we talked about the persona. And it all comes down to he is smarter than everyone else, and I think it continues to hold up because. Uh, being smarter than doesn't go out of style. Being dumber than does. Uh, being smarter than does and doesn't, I think. I th- okay. I think, or maybe you see if you agree or disagree. I think it's really divisive and it makes for a very specific audience. You either love the guy or you hate the guy. And some of that hinges on you responding to the intellectual foundation of what he's doing Mm -hmm. because it's not like you say, it's not just Pratt falls and it's not just pies in the face. It's way deeper than that. And the philosophical underpinnings of the thing, you're responding to those subconsciously on some level, but I think there's a portion of the audience that's responding just as much to their aversion to language. They don't want to put in the effort. They don't want to work that hard to try to understand the words he's saying. Um, I'm going to make a blanket statement. Okay. In that, uh, because I am so smart, (laughs) I like this movie and W.C. Fields. And if you don't, you are a demo. Is that fair? That's perfectly fair. I stand behind you 100%. Done. And the discussion of the intellectual underpinnings and the love of language is a perfect segue into my recommendation for further viewing this time. Okay, I have a guess as to what I think it's going to be, but I'm not going to say it out loud. I'm only going to cheer if I get it right. I, you, you didn't cheat and look at... No, no. Okay. Well, I'm not that smart. It's, in spite of what I said a little <laughs> while ago, I'm not smart enough to think that you wrote it down and then and then enough of a huckster... To go look and see what it is. Well, I did write it down. And what I wrote down is David Copperfield. I was right. From 1935. Directed by George Cukor. It is fantastic. And mainly because of W.C. Fields. Which you would have never guessed in a million years maybe. Leading up to that. But his performance as Macabre is one of the most spot on Dickens characters that you could possibly imagine. 
he had such a reverence for Dickens. He was his favorite author. He has to have because of all the names. If right. nothing else, the names. Right. Exactly. Um, it was the one instance in his working life where he did not vary from the text, mm. which is a big deal if you know how notorious he was for ad-libbing and leaving the rest of the cast behind. Because he was smarter and funnier mm-hmm. than all of them put together. But in this case, he had such a reverence for Dickens' written word that he played it completely straight. And it's perhaps the role he was born to play, even more so than him playing himself over and over again <laughs> in everything else he did. Sound recommendation. And your recommendation would be... Do you have a guess at I all? I have no There's idea. no way you're going to guess. No because idea. it is a complete departure, as I struggle, as I always do, with coming up with a recommendation. Uh, I landed on another trip to California, <laughs> which is The Grapes of Wrath from 1940 uh, by John Ford. That's not as far off as people think, maybe. It's the first thing that came to mind, honestly. The second thing was Chinatown. <laughs> but... I stuck with The Grapes of Wrath, um, uh, another uh, band of strivers and dreamers, and it doesn't go so well, spoiler alert, but check it out because it's absolutely beautiful. I can't even put into words how beautiful it is. And I think, uh, I'm assuming, I'm, my guess is W.C. Fields probably loved it too. Mm. No? Okay, never mind. Strike that out. It may be a little sentimental for him. Okay. I don't know, actually. I'm curious now that you say that. I, I wonder if anywhere it's recorded what he might have thought of that. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Because he did have some pretty strong opinions <laughs> about other entertainers. Okay. For instance, when asked about <laughs> Charlie Chaplin, the best thing he had to say about him that was that he was a goddamn ballet dancer. <laughs> what did he have to say about... Uh, my least favorite person, which is Mae West. <laughs> this is maybe my favorite celebrity burn of all time. Hit me. He said that she was a plumber's idea of Cleopatra. <laughs> so true. That doesn't give plumbers enough credit, <laughs> in my opinion. So, okay, so to wrap up, our recommendations are uh, David Copperfield and The Grapes of Wrath. Which brings us to the end of the episode. If you would like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email. Let us know what you think of the show at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to check out our website, it is just magiclanternpodcast.com. You can find all of our episodes complete with supplemental links and other fun stuff for each one at that address. We are on Twitter at lantern underscore cast. We also have a Facebook page at facebook.com slash magic lantern podcast. You can find us on iTunes or Stitcher Radio as well. And we would certainly appreciate it if you could rate and review us over there if you enjoy the show. Thanks for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 